Good evening. Good to have you with us for worship this evening. So good when we get together, we hear the Word of God, and we respond with songs of praise. Once again, good to have you with us. Welcome, and a very warm and sincere welcome to all of our guests and visitors. If you'd like to know more about St. John's and the Word of God that we teach, please be sure to get a hold of one of us. All of our information is on the back side of the worship folder. This is the worship service that also gets out online and on TV and also on the radio. And we thank those that work so hard to put this service together and then to get it out in all those different ways. Especially for those that will be hearing it on the radio, I'm Pastor Timothy Miller and I'm conducting the worship service this evening. Our preacher tonight is Pastor Nick Quinette and our organist is Mrs. Rebecca Miller. Our theme, our overall theme for these services is Come Lord Jesus. Today's theme is Come Lord Jesus as Judge. As you hear the Word of God, be sure to take it with you into your everyday life. Apply it to everything. And also use the Word of God to encourage each other in your Christian faith. Let's open. We're going to be predominantly using the blue hymnal this evening. And so let's open with a hymn from it. Hymn number 321. God's own Son, Most Holy.
please stand. Our order of worship is, of course, on the big screens and found in the blue hymnal, page 154, setting one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading and our first reading is also the sermon text, and it's taken from Isaiah chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. A shoot will spring up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will be delighted with the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, nor will he render decisions based on what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the poor, and he will render fair decisions in favor of the oppressed on the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath from his lips he will put the wicked to death. Righteousness will be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his hips. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf together, and a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze together, and their young ones will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the cattle. The nursing child will play near a cobra's hole. 
and the weaned child will put his hand into a viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy anywhere on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is what will take place on that day. The peoples will seek the root of Jesse, who will be standing like a banner for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. The word of the Lord. In the place of the psalm of the day, we sing hymn number 325, My Soul in Stillness Waits. Our second reading is taken from Romans chapter 15, beginning with verse 4. We, God's people, face judgment day not with fear, but rather with hope, through the root of Jesse, that is the Savior. Indeed, whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction, so that through patient endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we would have hope. And may God, the source of patient endurance and encouragement, grant that you agree with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that with one mind, in one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this reason, accept one another as Christ also accepted you to the glory of God. For I am saying that Christ became a servant of those who are circumcised for the sake of God's truth, to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. He also did this so that the Gentiles would glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. For this reason, I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. And again it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. 
and again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples give him praise. And again, Isaiah says, there will be a root of Jesse, and he is the one who will rise up to rule the Gentiles. On him the Gentiles will place their hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with complete joy and peace as you continue to believe so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Word of the Lord. Please stand for the Gospel acclamation and the Holy Gospel. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for Him, and all people will see God's salvation. The Holy Gospel is written in the Gospel of St. Matthew, the third chapter, beginning with verse 1. We are reminded how to prepare for Judgment Day. We are to prepare the way that people prepared as they heard the message of John the Baptist. It's the same for us today. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. In those days, John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. Yes, this is he of whom this was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all of Judea, and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River, as they confessed their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not think of saying to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Already the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who comes after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Please be seated. I invite you and ask you to fill out one of those white attendance cards in the rack in front of you. And after the sermon, you can place it in one of the offering baskets. This helps us to get to know our guests all the more and to serve all of you better and also to worship God, or encourage God's people in their worship life. Let's sing together the next hymn, hymn number 316, On Jordan's Bank, The Baptist Cry. <laughs>
peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, dear fellow redeemed. The picture that is being portrayed for us in the beginning part of our sermon text for today is one that many of you might be familiar with if you've ever cut down a tree before. Oftentimes, if you cut down a tree and you don't deal with that stump right away by maybe putting some chemicals on it to kill it or getting a stump grinder in there to grind it out, you'll find that in the months or weeks ahead, it will all of a sudden start to sprout. A tender shoot would come out of something that used to be seemingly dead. I know in my own house, we had two trees when we moved in, taken down about three years ago, and still every summer and spring, all of a sudden, this lifeless dead stump starts putting forth growth, no matter how many times I cut it off or how many times I spray it. You see life coming from something that seems to be dead, from something you wouldn't expect. And that's what Isaiah is describing for us today in our Old Testament lesson that life and hope will come from an unexpected place, something that you wouldn't be looking for it. Now, this is a very common reading for this time of year. It comes really around every year, and maybe we always don't get the full picture of what is happening here. Who is the stump of Jesse, or why is there a stump of Jesse? Who is Jesse? For us to see who Jesse is, we have to go back to that Old Testament and realize that Jesse was the father of King David. He was a shepherd. Not somebody who you would pay any attention to at all. Not somebody you would think would have a line of kings and the Savior coming from. He was a common person from the little town of Bethlehem. Yet God chose his son David to be king. And David ruled well, and David had a son Solomon. And after his son Solomon, uh, the, his sons ruled after him. But during that time, there was a split. The northern kingdom split off, and those kings didn't follow God at all anymore, and eventually judgment would come down on him. But the southern kingdom of Judah, that continued to have those kings coming from David's line. Some of those kings were good kings, and they followed after what God had said, followed after his word, but still many of them weren't. They followed after idols and those terrible practices with the, from the nations around them, and eventually led the people away from God as well. God made a promise. God made a promise to David that the Savior would come through his line. So even though the northern kingdom would eventually be taken away forever and destroyed, that southern kingdom would remain to some extent, where God would send the nation of Babylon to come and to take them into captivity for 70 years, with only a remnant to return. But let us not be fooled here that God was just going to let these other nations that he used as a tool to bring judgment down on his people to let them go unpunished un for what their, their unbelief as well. No, those great and mighty nations would be cut down too. Or their prestige would be taken away and destroyed. And maybe in a way what you can imagine it would look like would be a forest that's cut, completely cut with all that's left is stumps remaining from all these kingdoms that all their power and prestige was gone. Yet one of these stumps, this stump of Jesse, would have a shoot that comes from it, a shoot that would bring hope in the future. Where do we see that, that hope and joy coming from? It would grow and come from an unexpected place, an unlikely place. That stump of Jesse, that, from that house of David, would be reduced to its humble beginnings in Bethlehem as we see that that shoot would begin there with Mary and Joseph, as Mary would give birth to a son. An unlikely place. Where Mary was a virgin, this isn't a place you'd be looking for a child to come. It wouldn't be a place where you're looking for a king to come from at all. They were common people. Common people who were both from the line of David. Yet when, where do we find them? In this little town of Bethlehem, some place that you wouldn't necessarily expect it. And when they entered that town, it wasn't like everybody was opening up the doors and saying, oh, you have royal blood, you have royal blood in your line, come and stay here. Oh, that line of David had, had lost its prestige, and only place they had left to stay was a stable, and nobody paid attention to them. But there, as Mary gave birth to that son, 
that little shoot began to grow. The king of all the world was born, the greatest king that ever lived. And when he comes, look at how he was described. It says there, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. You see Jesus quoting this section of scripture in Luke chapter 4 when he's saying, this is me, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. What does the spirit give, give him? There are a couple of different attributes that are mentioned here. The first two, it says there, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might. These are features you would want in a king. The kings of the past, at least some of them had this, those ones that ruled well, and maybe some of them who didn't rule well still had this, because these are things you would want to be able to deal with the issues that were at hand, to be able to rule when these troubles came in and be effective ruler. But the next gift shows how this king, this shoot of Jesse, would handle those gifts. Where many of those kings before failed to not use them in the correct way. It says there, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord would be on him. This shoot of Jesse, this new king, this ultimate king, would only rule according to God's will. And he would only go and rule with awe and giving glory to God and everything. He wouldn't go off on himself, by himself and say, well, I think this is what needs to be done, and I'm going to do whatever I want. No, he would rule in such a way to give glory to God and only do what God wanted in his perfect will. We see this in Jesus when he said, I will always do the will of the Father. He would be that perfect king and that perfect judge where those past kings and judges failed so often in the past. This means he would truly rule and judge perfectly. You see, Advent means coming, and as we celebrate Advent, we are looking forward to celebrating the coming that had already came, or Jesus came that first time in Bethlehem, but we're also looking forward to that next coming, as he comes as our judge on Judgment Day. That day he will certainly serve as a judge, and not an imperfect judge like those kings of the past were, but one that's perfect in every single way. One that wouldn't be taking bribes as people try to get past the evil that they've done by buying him off. He's not a judge that we could try to lie to in some way and say, oh, look, this is really what we're doing. This is really where our heart is. This is really what I meant by that. No, this judge can see through all our lying and scheming. He, can, he weighs everything bare and finds the true motivation of our hearts. Nothing can hide from him. As it says in this section, it says there, He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips, he will put the wicked to death. These aren't necessarily words we always associate with Advent. This little shoot that would come would be coming to bring judgment down on the earth. And we see that John the Baptist in our gospel reading making this point where he says, His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It seems that this coming of the shoot of Jesse is something to fear. In the season of Advent, where we look forward to so much joy. To see why this is such a big part of Advent, we have to look and ask ourselves, why is there a stump of Jesse? Where there's a stump there, because as I already mentioned, the nation of Judah there was one that fell away from God. And so did David and his descendants for many of those kings. They fell into spiritual death and unbelief and destruction. Much like we see in the world around us today. In fact, I would say as we look at the world around us, it's no different than it was all the way back there during Isaiah's time and to things that were going on in Judah. Why is that? we possess the same problem that they had back then. We have that same sinful nature that they have back then. All we do is find new ways to sin and reinvent the same ways to sin in new and fresh ways. So that shoot of Jesse comes to bring judgment on this world. Look at the world around us. We don't find peace and joy, but we find suffering and pain because of sin, and we feel the effects of sin around us every day. 
The fact of the matter is, is we don't always try to avoid that. We don't always try to avoid sin. No, we charge headlong to join in with the rest of the world and do exactly what we are supposed to not do. With this in mind, we may look at Advent and look at it as fear, as, well, we're looking forward to that coming judge. When that shoot of Jesse comes, he will lay everything bare. And for us as Christians, we look at Advent with joy. We look for the coming of this judge, the shoot of Jesse, with joy. Why is that? See, this section says this. With righteousness, he will judge the poor. He will render fair decisions in favor of the oppressed on earth. Righteousness will be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his hips. Righteousness comes up a whole lot in this section. And maybe for a review and for an easy way to remember what righteousness means, righteousness means that we are right with God. That means we are right with God in everything that we do. We don't fail one time. We don't cut corners. Everything we do is completely in line with God. Still hearing that definition, we may look at this and say, well, this coming judge, this shoot, this root of Jesse that will come, we still look at it with fear because we see ourselves, we just mentioned that while we join in with the things of this world, it's not that we failed once, we fail over and over again. You see, we see that hope and joy when we realize what God means by that righteousness. See, when God mentions righteousness, he doesn't use this as some term that demands that we adhere to some fixed standard Rather, God himself is the standard from whom we need to live up to. And still, we look at that and say, well, we can't live up to God. Where is the hope? But when God has that standard, he provides us the means to meet that standard. Not by us doing something, but providing us that righteousness through his son, through that shoot of Jesse that would come. Where Jesus would come and on that last day as a righteous judge to judge us. And when he looks at us, what will he see? Not our own righteousness to try to gain salvation, but his righteousness covering us. Fully covering us in every single way. His righteousness is absolute. It's not that he will miss a spot here or there. It's completely covering you in every single way. That righteousness is provided to you for what he did as he died on the cross for you. That righteousness covering you began with that first advent, with that gentle cry of a baby in a manger in Bethlehem, where that baby cry was a cry of hope for all the world because that shoot of Jesse was here, that righteous judge was here, the Savior of the world was here to wash us clean and wash us fully with Christ's righteousness. And look what that brings us. Verses 6 through 9 says this. I'll read it for you again. It says, The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf together, and the little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze together, and their young ones will lie down together. The lion will eat the straw like the cattle. The nursing child will play near the cobra's hole, and the weaned child will put his hand into a viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy anywhere on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The scenes here that are depicted probably seem strange to all of us because this is not the way the world is. It depicts where there's vicious animals laying with what normally would be their prey. It's something that doesn't make sense. If you go to the zoo and if you'd see a sheep there and where the lions are, what would happen? That lion would devour it very quickly. It depicts a child not only playing next to the, den, uh, the, the nest of a poisonous snake, but even putting its hand in there, something we couldn't even imagine that we wouldn't even want to get close to. It seems strange to our ears. Yet this is the way God had originally designed the world to look exactly like this. It wasn't until sin entered this world that this completely changed. It's strange to think that this would have been the norm until sin came and wrecked everything. But what we surely see depicted here is the image of peace. Now this peace might seem completely unattainable today. It might seem like a dream of something that's impossible. But it's actually peace that each and every one of us has right now. As we have the righteousness of God washed over us, cleansing us, that righteousness of Christ there over and ruling in our hearts... 
As that gospel message has filled our hearts, we realize that we are full of this peace. We're full of the peace, the love, the joy, patience, kindness, goodness, and many more blessings from God that drive us. This faith gives us the, the ability to produce peace among us, to live with one another in harmony and peace in the future. We have this peace, yet as we look in the world around us, we realize that, well, this life isn't always peaceful. As we look in the world around us, we still see that struggle with sin and all the trouble that comes with it. But you see, this also gives us imagery for the future. Because when that righteous judge comes, what will he do? He will come and judge us perfect because of what he has done, judge us righteous and take us home to heaven with him forever. There, this peace would become a reality. There, what's described here will become normal for us, and what we've lived with, with here on this earth will seem strange because it is full of sin. There in heaven, we will not be affected by sin anymore. We won't know it. We'll just know this perfect, per, perfection and perfect peace and God's righteousness every day. This kingdom of peace has already begun. It has begun in our hearts, and it's spreading. It spreads every single time that gospel message is proclaimed to those who don't believe. It, it spreads as that gospel message works faith in their hearts as it worked it in yours. So you have that peace of knowing who you are, redeemed child of God. Peace knowing that God's righteousness has covered each and every one of you. As verse 10 says, this is what will take place on that day. The peoples will seek the root of Jesse, who will be standing like a banner for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. You see that coming out in our epistle lesson as the Gentiles there would be drawn to it. As he is the righteous king, the righteous judge for the whole world, and everyone will flock to him for peace. So we do too. What a change this section of scripture has from the beginning. Where that stump of Jesse, a shoot is coming from it. The shoot that brings us joy and hope for the future. That shoot that we run to because it brings us hope and peace. Amen. Please stand. We continue with confessing our faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Of all that it is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only, only Son of God, the eternal begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate with the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and a life of the world to come. Amen. At this time, we'll collect our offerings of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior. Please also place those attendance cards in the offering baskets as they are passed. We love because Christ first loved us. We continue with the offering hymn, hymn number 304, What Hope and Eden Prophesied.
pray. Dear Lord Jesus, Son of God and Son of David, we look forward with joyful hearts to the approaching celebration of your holy birth, grateful that you came here as one of us to lay down your life as a ransom for sinners. You are God, our everlasting King, and yet so that you might rule sinners like us with grace and forgiveness, you left your throne above and appeared here in weakness, poverty, and humility. With perfect obedience, you kept the law for us. In great anguish of soul, you bore our sins for us. And in great suffering, which finally ended in death, you were even punished in our place. We praise and adore you, Holy Jesus, for the precious gift of yourself, your very life for our salvation. Hear our prayers and hymns of praise as we lift our voices to you. Savior, we know that it is not the will of our Father that any should perish, but that all should be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Fill the world with this gospel's joyous sound, that hearts everywhere may reach out by faith to believe the precious kingdom you have brought, and together with us enjoy your gracious rule of mercy and forgiveness. We confess that we have often turned away from you do not on account of our sins bring judgment on us, but because of Jesus Christ, give us the hope that we heard again this evening. Keep our names recorded in your book of life and blot out our transgressions in Christ, in the root of Jesse. Help us to see ourselves as willing servants of your gospel, so that with righteous lives and loving hearts, we will ever praise you as Lord and Savior to all. To the glory of your name we make these requests. Amen. We follow the liturgy for Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please stand. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, 
Unite us as one and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. To him we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. seated. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper and members of our church and our church body come to Holy Communion, approach up the middle aisle and return by a side aisle. When indicated, kneel or remain standing at the rail. Receive the wafer with an open hand and take the wine cup yourself from the tray. If you prefer to be handed the wine cup, simply hold out your hand. Hold your wafer hand up like stop if you want a gluten-free wafer available in a sleeve on the tray. And non-alcoholic white wine is also available in the middle of the cup tray. And cup receptacles are along the walls. The common wine cup or chalice is provided as a choice. The general blessing will be given at the end. Come now, everything is ready.
Please stand. The true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord, look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We remain standing as we sing the final verse, hymn number 318, verse 4. Hark, a thrilling voice is sounding. Once again, so good to see you. It's always good to worship our Lord God together. have some important announcements. Uh, first of all, I'd like to encourage you to be sure to read through the entire worship folder. We have many details in there for uh, these events. As we get closer to Christmas, the events increase. We, of course, invite you to come to Bible classes. We have one tomorrow in between services, 9.10 to 10.10 with refreshments beforehand, and then on Wednesday at 10 o'clock over in the council chambers. And we have our Advent midweeks worship services at 3.30 and 7. And the juniors and seniors from Luther Prep will be joining us at the 7 o'clock service on Wednesday and will add to our worship with special singing. We have a meal in between those worship services, 4.15 to 6.15. Always such a delicious meal they prepare. On Thursday, the school winter concert takes place over at school, of course, at 6 o'clock in the evening. On Saturday at 9.30, there is a wonderful Christmas program at Luther Prep in its chapel for Jesus Cares. If you're wondering about Jesus Cares, it's for those with extra challenges, and it's just a, a wonderful program and worship service. This year, it's titled, The Bells Tell the Story. Our very own from our congregation, Reverend Reuben Schmitz, organizes it, leads it, runs it, and uh, what a wonderful way to share the gospel. You will love it. Again, it's Saturday at 9.30 at the Luther Prep School Chapel. There is a door offering today. The door offering will go to the children's Christmas bags. You know that we have that custom that we put together all those goodies in those bags and give them out to the children. Well, that's where your door offering will go this week and then also next week. There is a special event. It has to do with Christian company, but anyone is welcome on Sunday, December 11th. They'll be going to the Luther Prep School concert at 3 o'clock and then gather at Mrs. Warnicke's house for a little gift exchange and you can contact Mary Warnicke if you plan to attend. I'm sure you'll appreciate that. Again, all the details are found in the worship folder. As you leave, be sure to pick up your offering envelopes for uh, next year and to emphasize uh, your planning a tubing and skiing outing January 14th. 
That's all I have, and so I wish you all a very blessed week. God bless you all. Thank you.